This is a lecture about an ABA ethics opinion from 2011 that relates to model rule 1.8a. 1.8a deals with business transactions between a lawyer and the client and the types of conflicts of interest that can arise. And um, the ABA in 2011 addressed a particular issue. For my law students, it's important to, uh, to, to know some of the basics of this because um, these ABA ethics opinions are tested sometimes on the um, MPRE exam. I, I, in my experience, most MPRE exams will have at least two questions that are based on ABA ethics opinions. This is about ethics opinion 458. <clears throat> if you want to um, uh, take a look at it sometime, but I'm going to hit the highlights here. And here we're talking about changing your fee agreements, the fee agreements between a lawyer and a client after the representation is underway. And <clears throat> what it, and so our, you may remember that 1.8a, the, the comments are very clear that the rule does not usually apply to fee agreements, but it can apply if you are accepting property in, in lieu of money for attorney's fees. Like if somebody is, um, uh, assigning over their house or their camper or um, uh, their car or an ownership share of their business that they're starting or something like that, that does count as a, biz a business transaction with your client in addition to being a fee agreement. Now, some state bars, this is part of what prompted this, uh, a number of state bars consider changes to the fee structure after the representation is underway to be a business transaction for purposes of Rule 1.8a. In, in other words, uh, just to explain um, what's going on here, you take a case and you take it on a, as a plaintiff's lawyer and you take it on a contingent fee basis and you spend a lot of time, it turns out the case gets really complicated. And after you've done a, it, you've done a lot of work and are really invested, you can tell that it's not going to, um, it, it's not a high dollar case. And so either you're not going to prevail or um, you're going to, your client is going to win but it turns out the compensation that they're owed is going to be very small. And so it will be very tempting, even though part of the, the point of contingent fees is that you take the risk um, along with the client uh, uh, that, of the case, and you're supposed to screen cases ahead of time. Some lawyers, if there's really an unforeseen development in the case, will a, a, you know, a star witness becomes unavailable or a piece of evidence turns out um, not to be admissible, they start to have remorse about this and want to be paid something. And so they may ask the client uh, if they can switch to an hourly rate and um, be paid on that. <clears throat> Conversely, there are law firms th that may undertake a legal matter and, and agree to do it on a flat fee basis. And so a couple of the accounts that have come uh, 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 that we see or ex examples that we see are um, collections cases where uh, a firm agrees to do uh, collection accounts and they agree to do it for a flat fee, like a, a $2,000 or $5,000 for a cl per collection or something like that. And then one of the cases turns out to be um, uh, unexpectedly very complicated. Um, and so now they wish that they could um, uh, change to a, an hourly fee. We also see lawyers who agree to do something on a, um, an hourly rate or, uh, or a flat fee basis. And now it's going to turn into a windfall situation. So it, it turns out that the client is going to win um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and they didn't expect that. So now they really wish they could switch to contingent fee. And so what happens is as the representation is underway, the lawyer realizes that <clears throat> they simply um, mis, uh, misunderstood the situation and they really regret either agreeing to a contingent fee or not agreeing to a, a contingent fee or wanting an hourly fee. And so then they ask the client to switch. Um, the one thing you do need to know for my students, no matter what rule your jurisdiction follows, is, is that this is disfavored and there will often be a presumption that the lawyer is taking advantage of the client, right? So this is a little bit like when you hire a plumber and after they have your water uh, turned off and all the pipes taken apart, they tell you that the job is gonna cost a lot more. Um, you know, in law school, we call this a holdup game, <clears throat> or you take your car to the mechanic for 
um, uh, some some pretty simple maintenance, right? You want a new alternator or a new carburetor or something like that. And once it's up on the lift and and stuff like that, they tell you that they need a thousand dollars. You need a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars in repairs, and you're kind of stuck. And what we don't like is to see lawyers doing that to clients. And as a result, um, a, a number of jurisdictions have said that even though the fee agreement is not a business transaction, once the fee agreement is set, any modifications after that are business transactions under 1.8 and therefore would require the types of disclosures and, um, and uh, documentation and, and stuff put, it, put in writing or signed by the client and so forth that an, another business transaction like buying your client's house would necessitate. The ABA has taken a somewhat different position. <clears throat> so instead of treating it as a business transaction, the, in 2011, they took the position that a modification of an existing fee agreement is permissible under the model rules, but the lawyer must show, in other words, you have a burden to show that the modification was reasonable under the circumstances at the time of the modification and as well as communicated to and accepted by the client. In other words, the ABA is worried that lawyers are <clears throat> not really explaining to the client the change that's happening and doing something like at the end of a phone conversation, conversation saying, hey, I might need to uh, adjust my fee or something. And the client says, oh, sure, sure. And if you're going to make a change, you need to spell it out really clear and the client has to expressly agree to a change. And if they don't, then you are stuck. And also there's going to, there's a burden uh, at least a production on the lawyer to to show to provide some evidence that the change was reasonable and that you're not just exploiting the fact that the client has already kind of stuck with you and the representation is underway. Modifications sought by a lawyer that changed the basic nature of a fee arrangement or significantly increased the lawyer's compensation absent an unanticipated change in circumstances ordinarily will be unreasonable. In other words, you may remember, <clears throat> or actually we haven't covered fees yet. This is where 1.8 overlaps with the fee rule. Our general fee rule is apart from all the other mechanical rules about what you have to have in writing and when you can and can't charge contingent fees, um, the fees always have to be reasonable. And what we're saying here is we're, it's essentially a presumption that a, a new a change in fees is an unreasonable fee unless um, it was, there was something, there was an unanticipated change in circumstances. Now we're not talking about a slight increase, right? Like the case became so complicated and you went to the client and said, <clears throat> I, I need a little more money, like I'm gonna raise my fee by 10% or something. Here we're talking about switching from a contingent fee to an hourly fee or an hourly fee to a contingent fee, completely different um, fee structure and, um, and, uh, and allocation of risk for the lawyer. On the other hand, periodic incremental changes in a lawyer's regularly, um, regular hourly billing rates are permissible if this is communicated clearly and accepted by the client at the outset. And the periodic increases are reasonable under the circumstances. So just to explain, it may be that you, um, your many firms will have something like just an automatic 1% or 2% or 3% increase in fees um, hourly rate. So if you're billing, it will make it simple, $100 an hour, $200 an hour. Um, one year, it would be 103 or $206 an hour or something um, uh, when, with the turning of the calendar year and you do this to keep up with inflation and so forth. Um, it may be that you offer to do a client's work um, at, a, at a discount initially, and then if they want you to continue working for them, they need to understand that there's these modest increases every calendar year. And, and that's fine as long as you um, express it uh, clearly, uh, the client is on notice, right? Uh, up front, by the way, on January 1st, our, uh, our fees the whole, for every client of the firm are going up by 3% or something like that. It's an across the board fee increase to adjust for inflation and so forth. And if they know about it 
and it's reasonable, that's fine. What we don't want to see is something where there's some sort of crisis going on. I'm doing these lectures during the coronavirus pandemic, for example. And so you could have some sort of crisis that makes it difficult for people to switch lawyers um, for some reason. And, and then you're essentially, it, you try to engage in price gouging. Like you announced to all your clients that starting next month, your fees are doubling. Well, that would be an unreasonable increase in fees, right? So the fact that you can get away with it because of some sort of extreme crisis you, that you're, is going on in your region is not what makes it reasonable. Um, incremental increases to reflect changes in the economy, um, changes in cost of operation, for example. So if your jurisdiction now re has suddenly required malpractice insurance or premises insurance or something like that, or um, a, a, an upgrade in all of your uh, technology and your network security or something, then it's reasonable to have an incremental increase in your fees. And then here's an example from the ABA in 2011. Um, many lawyers increase their normal or regular hourly billing rates incrementally from time to time, often on an annual basis, as I've been explaining without negotiating every increase separately with every client. They just have a firm wide annual increase of certain percentage points. Such billing practices, if communicated clearly to clients at the commencement of the client lawyer relationship are permissible. Uh, just for my students, I teach here in Houston, Texas, and um, we have a, te a Texas ethics opinion from 2018, it's number 679. It's similar to the ADA's um, opinion from uh, 2011, but has a subtle difference. Um, the Texas Bar ha Ethics Commission has uh, decided that changing from a fixed flat fee uh, um, to an hourly because the matter has become more complicated is presumptively unfair. And it's a slightly different wording and maybe, the, maybe it's not a difference in substance, maybe it's only semantic, but it could be it, to the extent that fair and reasonable are each technical terms, um, this is a little bit different. And they're very, very clear that there's a presumption that the burden is on the lawyer to show that a change is fair under the circumstances. And the incident that prompted this question to come to the Texas State Ethics Commission was a debt collection um, a, a law firm, a law firm that does bill, debt collecting um, uh, for uh, creditors um, uh, realized that there was a um, class, or I'm sorry, a debt collection uh, case and they're re representing debtors. Uh, they realized that it, there was really a class action um, afoot, that a whole group of people, of borrowers uh, um, were being defrauded or something like that. And so um, th that, might, uh, that might justify it, right? It, most uh, class action lawsuits are very complicated, very time consuming. And so if you had agreed to do something um, for a fixed or flat fee for every collection case, and now all of a sudden you're doing this massive class action lawsuit, that might justify uh, the circumstances that justify switching to an uh, hourly rate, right? Because you're, you're, if nothing else, you're gonna have to turn away other clients and other business. Um, on the other hand, the simple fact that you agreed to litigate on behalf of a client and now the other party has filed a counterclaim, does that make the case more complicated? Yes, and it either makes it maybe 50% more complicated, twice as complicated, but that's foreseeable enough. It does not justify modifying your fee. Um, keep in mind that Texas has said that Rule 1.08a, which is its equivalent almost verbatim of 1.8a in the model rules does not apply to fees or to fee modifications during the representation. Instead, the presumption of unfairness limits lawyers from exploiting their clients. Uh, the very fact that they have to say that though is a reminder to my students, um, if you are practicing in other jurisdictions, there are other states that do apply 1.8 um, to changes in fees. Okay, unrelated to the ethics opinion, there's a couple of odds and ends that I need to uh, mention related to 1.8a. Um, most jurisdictions hold that 1.8a applies when a lawyer receives compensation for referrals to non-lawyer professionals, uh, such as investment advisors. And so, <clears throat> in other words, 
if, um, if you have a client who's a financial advisor and they help people uh, manage their money and do their investments and put money away for retirement and things like that, and they pay you a referral fee for sending people to them, um, that's a business transaction with a client, right? That you as a lawyer are give basically the same as if you sold your um, list. If the person is your client, this is a business transaction. You don't charge legal fees for it. You should be aware that Texas and a few other states have concluded that compensated referrals are improper, even with full disclosure and consent. So it doesn't matter in Texas if you comply with one point, uh, the equivalent of 1.8a. And I do, uh, we're going to mention this again when we get to um, the lectures on fees, but m the modern trend is away from permitting any type of referral fees for lawyers where you get paid just for sending somebody uh, to somebody else. Um, this used to be more common and every year I see more, it seems like I see more ethics, have been, more states coming out and saying you can't do this. And so um, the I, lawyers in Texas, you can't, I can just tell you, you can't do that. And even in other states, you really should check because the trajectory or the trend is towards prohibiting referral, uh, these types of referral fees with non-lawyers. <clears throat> if you need to document uh, for attendance purposes that you watched this, here's our quiz question. And if you're one of my students, you can either email me the answer or just keep it for your records in case an, a question about uh, it, your attendance arises. How does the ABA categorize a change in the fee structure during the representation, e.g. contingent fee to hourly? A, is it a business transaction under 1.8A? Um, it is B, it is presumptively unreasonable fee unless the lawyer can justify the change. C, it is strictly forbidden or D, it is always permitted. So if you think you know the answer, you should if you watch the video, and if you don't, you really should re-watch or re-listen to this video, and you can um, send that to me to document that you watched this.